Welcome to the Fly Culture Podcast, bringing you interviews, reviews, and fishing tips. Here's your host, Pete Tigus. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very latest Fly Culture Podcast. This one's being recorded in early April. We're still obviously in lockdown at the moment, and I hope everyone out there is keeping safe and well. Um, I hope this podcast goes in some small way at least to fill a gap in your lives where you're missing fishing right now and I hope you're enjoying listening to these if there are any requests that you have don't hesitate in just dropping me a line and if you think there's somebody that I should be interviewing or speaking to let me know and I'll see if I can tie those things up but I'm really excited about this podcast I'm making my second transatlantic podcast and I'm heading this time over to Montana and I'm going to be speaking to Jess Hadel Richardson, who is a pro photographer and a fly angler from Montana. I was really thrilled that we used one of her images for the very latest cover of the spring edition of Fly Culture. It's striking and it's different. And that's what we try and do with all the covers and the content within Fly Culture magazine. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing that one as much as I have. I also on this podcast I hope to learn some more about life in Montana the fishing there and it's a place that's very close to my heart I've been lucky enough to fish over there a number of times and get some photography tips too so I'm really really looking forward to this one. Jess good to have you here how's it going? Thanks it's great to be chatting with you and um, everything's you know um, I'm grateful I'm in Montana especially while all this is going on you know as you know what Montana is pretty wide open so I feel like we're blessed to be in an area where um, my closest neighbor is a 600 acre ranch that surrounds me (laughs) so I am grateful that I'm not in a major city at this time but it's it's tough and um, it's tough to see what's going on especially around the world and um, also everybody's, you know, businesses have shut down. I myself, uh, am unable to, to go off and do any of my contracts that, you know, we had previously set up, but it is what it is and it could always be worse. And, um, I, I'm just grateful that all my family and everybody's okay. And everybody's kind of hiding inside like they should be. So <laughs> that's good to hear, isn't it? And I think people have been, we'd had this terrible rush of people for some strange reason heading to the coast in numbers and to beauty spots and I think that hopefully has given people the wake up call that they needed and it seems as though everyone's been incredibly sensible and and that's great to great to hear and like I say we'd seen the rushes in the shops and everything else for stuff and that's eased back now and and I'm I'm hoping it's 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 just some, something so completely different, isn't it? Something none of us have dealt with before. And I hope we all come out of it with something. I hope it's positive as well. I know people are going through some tough stuff at the moment, and I hope that they do come out of it the other side. Um, and, you know, we do come out of it as a as a planet, really, in, in good shape. But we're going to try and stay positive because what I want to try and do with these things is um, – give something for people to actually listen to and enjoy and you know magic word that you mentioned there is montana um i'd like to talk a little bit more about that but how's winter been over there have you had a lot of snow well actually yesterday uh it was a pretty crazy day um we actually had a very mild winter this year and the part of montana that i live in is called the bitterroot valley and i'm just outside of missoula so i'm on the like west southwest side of montana even though i think it's central montana but apparently i'm wrong um like i th- i feel like we're in the middle of the south or the the uh, west side but um uh, no i'm southwest but i'm in a banana belt area so we typically do not get a lot of moisture where i live but the, our mountain peaks are gosh close to 9000 feet to 14000 feet all down this valley here so um we've had great snowpack on the mountains but very little snow in the valley and i'm okay having a nice winter this year but yesterday we had snow rain sleet and to top it off we had an earthquake so wow you that's a full house yeah yesterday was a crazy day i was in the living room and um the earthquake was about I think about a hundred miles to the west of us in Idaho, it was 6.5 epicenter and uh, the uh, whole house started shaking. It's the fourth er earthquake I've been in. I'm from the West coast of British Columbia. So, you know, grew up being scared of earthquakes and um, I I can tell you right now I froze. (laughs) I didn't, 
I didn't move. I I guess in the face of danger, I'm not the best person to be with. <laughs> But that's amazing part, putting into context where you are. And I've been fortunate to fish in Montana a number of times. It's a place very close to my heart. And as we were talking off mic, it's actually the name of my dog as well. But um, the Missoula, I think, and I've said to people in the past, if my lottery numbers came up, that is probably where I would buy my big lodge on the river. And you've got the Clark Fork going through the middle of the town. You've got the Bitterroot, the Blackfoot. You've got um, Rock Creek, which, man, that's and that's a special place for me because before I ran um, Fly Culture, um, I ran an online free not-for-profit online magazine called Eat, Sleep, Fish. And it came about that I was sitting on Rock Creek, called a fish, and thought, I think this is about as good as it gets. And I wanted to share that experience. And that's one of the reasons I'm sitting here talking to you right now, because of Rock Creek. And we used to go into the Grizzly, grizzly Hackle fly shop, the, the little coffee shop next door, have a bowl of porridge, cup of coffee, and then into the shop before we started our days just to have a wander around. So it really is a wonderful part of the world. Yeah, it really is. I, I, um, I'm super grateful. And I'm also grateful for the fact that um, I'm in this particular area of Montana. I've only been here for five years. So uh, living in this area compared to a lot of other places in Montana, which I know are beautiful, but the winters can be very, very harsh. So for me, uh, coming from the West Coast, Pacific Northwest, where I have rain winters and beautiful uh, old growth forests and ferns and green, um, I'm I'm grateful that I moved to this part of Montana and I'm not in, say, Billings or somewhere where it's very windy and very cold and um, you just have longer winters down there. So, um, and I know each of those places are gorgeous and beautiful and close down to Yellowstone, but they get so much snow. So I'm happy and we're I'm right here in the Bitterroot. So I'm a uh, just about half a mile from the river, um, walking and waiting available. And um, I also have a little creek at the back of my property uh, that you can fish for little browns and little brook trout uh, starting in the springtime in June. So very lucky. And don't forget the Big Hole River too. That's such a great river too. That's not too far for grayling you can get. And um, so very grateful where I live here. It sounds to me as though you've got it exactly sussed. Yeah, I, I picked the perfect place. And, you know, and I, I always say, like, um, a lot of people you know, ask me, well, how did you leave Vancouver, Canada? You know, why would you leave British Columbia? It's so beautiful there. And I said, I, I absolutely agree. But I also think I moved to another incredibly beautiful, amazing place. So I'm really grateful that I grew up in Vancouver, um, love the ocean, and I'm, I'm so happy that I moved to such a gorgeous state. I would have a hard time if I lived somewhere else, I think. <laughs> yeah. And you mentioned the big hole there, and I know we've chatted previously about that. And you mentioned grayling as well, which are a fish that I love. And I went to Montana to fish one time. I can't remember if I flew into Missoula or Bozeman, but we went all the way down to Wisdom just so that I could go and try catch a grayling, which we did. And you'll know exactly where I mean in Wisdom at the bottom where the bridge just up from there was a tiny pool there. I've got a rod upstairs that I dropped. I was so excited about catching grayling that I dropped it and it's got a scuff mark on it from um, the big hole there. And because it's one of the last bastions of, of fluvial or river grayling, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, the big hole is pretty special to uh, my family here. My husband runs a ranch, a family ranch up in uh, Wisdom. And so uh, we kind of go between the the Bitterroot and Wisdom, Montana. And so he's up there a lot. Yeah, we run cows up there. And so I have been granted permission by one of the ranchers to fish about 28 miles of private riverfront. So um, I, do, I go alone, which can be a little nerve wracking because of the moose there and also grizzly bears and such. But um, I remember when I caught my first grayling on that river and honestly, it was a incredibly special moment. And uh, I was I was shocked. I was like, I think I caught a grayling. I think I caught a grayling. And so for me, um, that, it's such a cool river. And, and you know, and they have a great um, a gentleman there also who does a lot of the grayling studies and, and whatnot. And so uh, he's out of Dillon, Montana. And um his name's Jim. I, I can't remember his last name, but he, he's doing a lot of work to help preserve the grayling in that area too. So I think it's really special. It's, it's a cr an incredible place too. You know, the big hole's amazing. Yeah, 
Yeah, and that cafe and the wisdom that does those huge great burgers as well. That's fantastic. We stayed just over the bridge on the right. There was a little funky B and B there and we just stayed in there and it was just fantastic. So yeah, it's it's just all everything about the fishing and the lifestyle and everything. And I think I could even live in Missoula. I, I just like the feel of the place as well, with the university being there and everything else. The feel was just really good, a little bit bohemian, a little bit arty. I, I just really, really dug it. I thought it was a really cool place. Yeah, it's it's a really cool town. And, um, you know, coming from a major city of what Vancouver is close to 4 million, if not 4 million. And, and I, I grew up a city girl, you know, I'm, I'm from the actual city. Um, and then moving to Montana, and, I, and we're in the we're just 30 minutes uh, south of Missoula. So it's easy to, to jump in the car, head into Missoula, get what we need. Um and but but I'm I'm far enough out of Missoula that the nice thing is it's so quiet here and it's our it's our little uh, little paradise I think and um, you know it's we're surrounded by mostly ranches and some farms but mostly ranches so it's mostly cows here and um, and so I'm just it's it's just so different from the way I grew up and I'm okay with that it's just it's turned into an amazing place but to be honest with my work I. I don't generally work as much in the state of Montana. I fly other places for work. So I kind of get the best of both, both worlds. I get to take off and, and head out for work and fly somewhere. And then I come home to nice and quiet, no traffic. <laughs> Fantastic. You, you talked about your work and we're going to come on to that now. And again, thank you so much um, for letting us use your image as a front cover. I, I, it was a really striking one and one I'm really proud to to have as a front cover as well how did you actually become involved in the photographic industry how did that, where did that start had you also always sort of used the cameras as a youngster and, and and it just grew from there how did how, how did the route go yeah so um i actually uh, was was well into middle school in Canada um, that I borrowed my mom's 1978 Minolta SLR camera. Actually, I have it behind me on the wall here, um, along with I, I have about a collection of 56 vintage uh, film cameras in my studio and try to shoot yeah. film, <laughs> try to shoot film whenever I can. But um, so, yeah, it was in it was, you know, before I got into high school and I would shoot a ton of pictures and I was always um, I'm a very um, art kind of person. Um, and, uh, you know, I was drawing and, and photographing and just making things. And, uh, I finally got to high school and then I was allowed to take classes that, um, taught you darkroom techniques and how to develop film and how to use your camera. And, um, so that's kind of what started it. Once I figured out how to use my camera and how to develop things and how to, and the techniques, you could start to see what you were being taught put into practice. Um, I'm actually, uh, I was a former athlete. I played um, women's ice hockey and I went to university in Michigan uh, for a four-year scholarship. I played division one NCAA women's hockey, which might not mean a lot to uh, people across the pond there, but um, it's basically allowed me to have a full scholarship and a uh, free education in the United States. So I, um, I was still doing photography. I had a dark room at my parents' house before I headed out to college. And when I got to university, I was it was sports and schoolwork. That was it for four straight years. Um, but I took as many photography courses as I could. But I did not go to a university that had maybe a program that I wanted to become. I saw free education and just jumped for it. Um, so... I actually went and got my business degree while at the same time taking as many photography courses as possible. Mm -hmm. And randomly enough, I just started selling images to coaches. Um, and when I finished my four years, I graduated um, in uh, business administration. My mom and dad really wanted me to come back to Canada. And um, at that point, they found me a photography program. So I did a two-year professional photo imaging diploma program to continue my uh, education. And when I finished that, I just started full tilt into being a professional photographer. So I've been running my business now since uh, 2008. And has that been an interesting process, building a business? Um, because I guess with how photography is now comparable, and it's really interesting that 
Um, you talk about dark rooms and things like that, that our daughter um, is a photographer as well. And people say, well, it's digital, da, 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 da. But she actually had a dark room. And I feel as though she sort of did her trade as well and learned her trade by developing films and used to, she's got an old Canon A1 that she, you know, would put film in and, and develop images like that. Is it difficult to get into that industry and did you know a direction that you were actually going was it going to be outdoor pursuits was it going to did you know where you were going with that well and not right off the bat um first of all if you have an opportunity to shoot film and you um can train in that i think it's so incredibly beneficial but i don't think it's necessarily it's not the be all end all these days um i think you can learn a lot faster using digital so if you're a kid and you're going through high school right now or if you're an adult who wants to learn photography uh definitely digital photography is going to be your easiest pursuit. And I think the most relevant, I still shoot film because, um, you know, I classify myself as a photography geek. <laughs> so part of my experience when I take photos is the mechanical process I get from the vintage cameras. And I think that there is, um, a kind of a lost, um, tactile kind of function in today's society where maybe kids or people don't necessarily have switches, dials, dials and gauges and things that they tactily can, I don't know if that's a word, <laughs> can feel in their hands. And I think that makes a big difference. And, and so there is definitely a resurgence in, um, in analog using film. And uh, if people are interested in shooting film, it's actually, you can still do it today. Um, you could probably go to your local thrift store and find yourself a film camera for super cheap. Uh, film will cost you a little bit of money. Lots of places develop. I develop in my own studio and I don't have a dark room dark room anymore. My studio is not light tight, but you can do it through um, using bags and um, proper techniques. But anyways, so I do think there is a benefit to training. It's a very trial and error process when it comes to film. And I think that's so beneficial. It's okay to fail and then figure it out and and and, and do better next time because that's how we learn. But um, yeah, oh, sorry. No, it's interesting it you talk about the analog stuff and, um, you know, it's kind of like we've seen vinyl making a comeback, magazines, you know, and we're seeing magazines, um, hopefully independent ones anyway, um, are being produced, you know, in the UK, we're seeing shops that are specializing in, in independent magazines, uh, even coming to fishing, really, I guess people wanting to fish, um, bamboo rods as well and do you think that's part of that as well that people are rediscovering a newer generation are rediscovering those things yeah you know and it's it's always popular to for things to come full circle and to you know people to get back into what used to be you know popular back in the 80s and 90s and 70s we we know it always comes full circle and and i think that's beneficial and it's beneficial to me as a person who loves to shoot film well the only reason why i can still shoot film today is because it's kind of come full, full circle and become popular again and um and and i i'm i'm super grateful for that and i so yeah i just think it's uh it's definitely for me because I was in that film area. I think it's definitely that trial and process kind of you learn from your mistakes and you don't, you, you know, you learn to take meticulous notes on your exposures. And then when you develop it, you can see, okay, like this is what I, you don't have that instant gratification and that's okay. I think that's something we need every once in a while because unfortunately we're all trained in instant gratification at this point in our lives. And, but um, even though I do all this in film, I don't work with the chemicals anymore to enlarge images. Um, because I would rather not use those chemicals. Um, they are, they can be pretty harmful. So now it's funny. I shoot film. I get the shot on a uh, manual camera and then I develop it and then I have to scan it to get it back onto a digital form on the computer. So, you know, it, it's just a different um, process, but I would like to say that I do not get hired to shoot film. Um, I, my goal for 2020, as silly as this sounds, is, you know, with my editorial work, I do for magazines. My goal this year is to get some film images published, which is so funny because that was the norm. That's how 
you know, there was no other norm than that. In even like the early 2000s, that was the norm. The norm is uh, you'd shoot film and you'd send your slides into your editor. And um, but yeah, that's a goal f- goal of mine this year. I've been shooting a lot of black and white um, in my own time and portraits especially. And I'm hoping that I can kind of push some of those forward to get uh to get, um, you know, put into an editorial piece. I think it would be a really cool story to kind of also maybe piece together a story that might be from, um, you know, vintage to nowadays and kind of move through the digital or move through film into digital transition. That's kind of my 2020 goal. Um, but yeah, no, I don't get hired commercially to, um, uh, to shoot film at all. Uh, so it's all in my spare time is when I'm shooting film. Um, so, but to answer your question from a lot earlier about outdoor industry and if I knew and no, like when I came out of photography school, I came out to be a professional photographer. And that's what I, you know, I talk to a lot of young kids today and, and my whole thing to them is um, if you come out of photography school and really close yourself off and just say, I want to be a fishing photographer. And that's all I want to do. I want to be a climbing photographer. And that's all I want to do. I really think you're limited, limiting yourself. And you're limiting um, your ability to have all these experiences and to make money shooting a very wide variety of different things that can help you become a very well rounded photographer. Um, You know, I say to people go shoot weddings, because if you go shoot a wedding, you can become a food photographer, a portrait photographer, a landscape photographer, a macro photographer, all in one day. And you take that then into what you eventually want to specialize in. So I've been specializing now in the sports fishing industry since uh, about 2012, 2013. Before that, I mean, I've shot everything and anything. And I think that's okay, because uh, that is the experience that I bring uh, when a company hires me, is uh, I can be that very well-rounded photographer for them. And I think that's really important. And so unfortunately, what that means to the younger generation is you got to put in your time and you got to work hard and you will then be able to kind of move and transition into maybe what you want to uh, specialize in. So, And I'm sort of sitting, uh, listeners can't really see, but I'm um able to see your studio your area there with as you say the vintage cameras there and but what you also have are framed um covers from magazines that you have shot and i can see angler's journal i can see eastern fly fishing in the bite Uh, there's all the big name titles there boat us yeah there's a number of them there northwest fly fishing there's so many of them where did it start for you where where did the break come from a sport fishing point of view Yeah, so I was in photography school in British Columbia. And um, part of being in photography school is you have to do a practicum with a couple different photographers. And I was always, I mean, I played um, hockey. So I was always really into sports. And I actually, I love to photograph sports. And so I managed to get a uh, practicum with the head photographer of the Vancouver Canucks in the NHL. And um, so I, yeah, it was a dream come true. Um, you know, being able to be in an arena to photograph professional NHL hockey. I mean, I was the only female that I could see in that arena. And the practicum led to being his assistant. And then the assistant led to shoot shooting in the arena for the team as a second shooter. And, um, uh, that was, um, that was amazing to be able to have that experience. So how it kind of led then to outdoors, I, I thought I was going into the editorial kind of, you know, uh, uh, hockey, football, baseball kind of world. But honestly, a lot of those guys were trying to get out of that industry because editorial industry can be difficult, as you know, and it can be really flooded with a lot of different photographers. So I was still shooting weddings. I was shooting, I let's see, I shot for cabinet companies, floor companies, real estate's a big one. You can really make a good living photographing real estate. Uh, so there was all these different things. But what happened was NHL players, especially in British Columbia, a lot of them like to fish. (laughs) You have a lot of Europeans and a lot of of Canadians and a lot of West Coast, East Coast kind of guys that play hockey. And a lot of them like to fish. So there was some charity tournaments that the Vancouver Canucks uh, always held every year. 
And I grew up on the ocean. I grew up to the daughter of a, of a boat captain. My dad was a captain for 47 years. And so I grew up on boats. I have my own captain's license. I used to run eco tours, driving whale watching tours. And so the head photographer for the Canucks was like, hey, there's a fishing uh, derby going on up in northern British Columbia off of Haida Gwaii. Uh, it's an island uh, basically looking across at Alaska, way up in northern BC. It's a beautiful island. And um, you fly in by a helicopter and you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have humpback whales circling you. And he said, I need someone to go up there. Could you go up for the team? And I said, yes, please <laughs> <laughs> have a chance to photograph bald eagles, whales and nature. And then I was like, and fish. <laughs> sure, I would love to do that. So I got sent north and that was in 2007, I believe, or 2008, early uh, in the summertime. I went up there and then ended up um, having a great time photographing salmon um, of these guys. It was a catch and release tournament. So it was you could get kind of creative and I drove my own boat. So that was super easy. And then um, it led to a very long relationship with this particular fishing lodge called West Coast Fishing Club. And now um, I think we're going on to uh, year 12 this summer. So I just now go up for a week here and a week there. I fly into the lodge um, and not for this particular tournament anymore. But I go to photograph everything from their food to their inside interior to portraits of the their their staff. And then we're out on the boat and we shoot everything from nature, wildlife to underwater fish releases. Um, just really try to capture as much imagery for their marketing and their website every year. So that's how it all started. And that was, uh, yeah, that was in 2008, 2007. And wow. And so they ended up opening a, a lodge down in Panama to do a more marlin fishing, bill fishing kind of thing. And so next thing you know, a couple of years later, in 2011, I find myself on an airplane heading to South America to photograph reptiles. As far as I'm concerned, marlin look like dinosaurs. Um, and 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 I got thrown into a world that I had no idea that that would lead me to where I am today. Um, so it's pretty incredible. And it's really interesting what you say about photographing everything and anything and how that makes you a better photographer as well. And I think that's a really fascinating, interesting tip for, for aspiring photographers as well, isn't it? It's a really good point. Yeah, I, I honestly think that... Um... You, I, I, I have a feeling that, you know, I get re a, a lot of kids, sorry, reaching out to me or, or I call them kids. I'm 36. So I get a lot of, you know, kids in their 20s and early 30s reaching out to me, wanting to know how did they become a fishing photographer? How do they become an outdoor photographer? And I said, well, you know, keep your goal in mind on what you want to do. Sh you know, go out in your own time, photograph all those things on the side that can help you get to where you want to go, create content that will help you get there. But be willing to take work in any other avenue. So you can sit down at night and call yourself a professional photographer. Because I think that's that's the thing is this market is very saturated. There's a lot of photographers out there. But I wouldn't call them all professional photographers. If you guide on the side and you take pictures on the side, you're not a professional photographer. And that's okay. But maybe work your way to becoming a professional photographer by allowing yourself to expand on what you shoot. And so, you know... I get asked a lot of questions from people saying, well, you know, how do you deal with all the people taking photos and how do you deal with everybody, you know, taking pictures? And I said, you know, and I, I know uh, there was one of the questions you had sent me is about iPhone usage and stuff. So I'm not worried about people taking photos out on the river. I think that there's a lot of people taking good photos and that's amazing. I think the more people out there taking content, creating content, that's incredible. It's great for Instagram. It's great for, for everything like that. But there's not a lot of people taking great photos on the river. And that's, I think that's what separates it. You know, so there's a lot of good photos coming out of everybody's cameras, but the professionals are separated from the great photos. So. And does that, is there a sense of pressure with that role as you say, with Instagram, with people putting pictures out, putting pictures out, you know, you're a hugely talented 
um, photographer and I've seen a lot of um, images that you sent me and, and the stuff that you put on Instagram as well. But does, is, is there a sense of pressure of having to always keep upping the game a little bit more to, to, to make that difference between snappers and, and real professional photographers? Um, no, I mean, I think it keeps me making sure that I'm creating content, holding myself accountable for continuing to work hard. But honestly, um, so I shoot now. So just to kind of give you a clear idea of what my role is in the fishing industry is I'm a, I, I would classify myself as a commercial fishing photographer. So I shoot on the commercial side. So I'm shooting the images of the rods, the reels, the clothing, the bait, the lures. I am based primarily in the conventional tackle world compared to the fly world. And the reason is the conventional tackle world pays better. Saltwater, offshore, bass fishing, in the United States, there's much more money being funneled into those avenues of fishing than there is in the fly fishing world. But I, I love shooting fly fishing. You know, you have to keep in mind a lot of fly fishing companies are owned by conventional tackle companies. So that is also something to to realize that a lot of these fly companies, uh, their the, you know their money is coming from their larger um, owners who might be say someone like Shimano owns G Loomis or Pure Fishing owns. Uh, Hardy. So that's just something to keep in mind that a lot of these big conglomerates own into the, the fly world. So I do shoot mostly in the conventional world, but I have never once ever lost a job to someone with an iPhone. That, that just doesn't happen in the commercial world. There are no iPhone photos being blown up at iCast in the United States to go up, you know, maybe one or two here and there. I don't want to say never, but it's, it's, that doesn't happen. So Instagram is its own beast. Um, I have had images purchased for Instagram and that's great, but I don't rely my income on what's going to be purchased for Instagram. I rely my income on being hired to go do these commercial shoots for catalogs, to do commercial shoots for their websites, for promotional bits. And I'm also having to do some film work now, uh, wade into the film world to shoot, uh, to shorts, uh, to shoot shorts. And the shorts are, are mostly for social media at that point. But yeah, I see my work in in larger sporting goods stores and catalogs. And um, that's, that's always exciting. And on websites and um, sometimes on packaging too, a lot of packaging when you go into a store and you, you, you know, grab the product, um, you'll see a, a shot that you've taken and it's on the packaging of the product. So that's where I make my money in the commercial industry. Also, I shoot editorial work, and that's kind of the side part. So I submit continually to a group of probably close to 15 different magazines, and that spreads across the board from fly fishing all the way into offshore conventional Marlin, um, you know, Marlin Magazine, any of the Bonnier Corporation magazines in the United States as well, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life. Uh, the editorial wor world is a hard world to make a living, and it's something that I'm incredibly proud of. Um like I had said to you uh, when we weren't recording, I had uh, my best year. I had eight covers last year and they're almost as good as my university diploma, if not better. That's how I feel because that's what I started. I always was the person who had wanted to see an image in the newspaper. I, I, you know, that was the cream of the crop for me. So um, I have a passion for that and I love to submit editorial work. So for Instagram, unfortunately, I have to hold a lot of work back. You can't, you know, I don't get to post all my best images because I have to save them for editorial pieces. A lot of magazines don't ever want to see the image on Instagram before they publish it. And it's the same with my commercial work. The majority of my images I never get to see or, or post, and I maybe repost them if the brand posts them. So I sit on thousands upon thousands of images that I can't put out into the public domain, but that's okay. That's just my job. That's, that's part of it. So. Cool. Thanks. That was a really interesting insight into it and uh, makes a lot of sense of what you're saying going for the bigger marketplace as well. Would it be fair to say, though, from a photography point of view that, and I'm biased, I know, so I'll, I'll throw my hand in now with that, but would we be right in saying that perhaps fly fishing is slightly more photogenic? Totally. <laughs> I mean, I think it also depends on how you see it. So my eye, I'm definitely enjoy the fact that fly fishing and, and let's, let's define it. So 
uh, freshwater fly fishing, trout fly fishing to me is a lot slower paced and you deal with everything from beautiful areas of mountainous areas to different weather patterns. And then you have the trout themselves that are gorgeous and beautiful and it's very different. But then I've, I've shot a lot of, uh, let's say offshore saltwater fly fishing and bonefish. I mean, I've been to Christmas Island and documented there and Florida, Louisiana for redfish. So it, each area and each element is different. I find I'm a lot more restricted when I have to shoot fly fishing from a boat. You know, you just can't capture it all as much as you would on foot. But it just adds to the different challenges. But, the, you know, there's something that comes back to the natural feel and the creative ability that you have when you're shooting um, a slower paced kind of fishing style, which I think is, you know, spay casting or fly fishing here. Um, and I, I love that. So actually, the majority of the fly fishing I photograph here in Montana is all for editorial pieces. Um, it's not mostly commercial shoots because a lot of these companies that do want to hire a photographer for the commercial side of fly fishing, they always seem to to stray towards saltwater. Uh, I think it's just, it fills that dream of that bucket list thing that someone can go and do. Um, even though their largest market shares are trout anglers, that is their largest market shares in, in all these companies. But I find myself down in these warm areas, which is amazing. But um, we're always shooting kind of more offshore saltwater bonefish, um, redfish, that kind of stuff. And um, I think it's just there's a, a lure behind it. It's the it's the dream trip that an angler would probably want to make. So, you know, it, it's just, it's different. But fly fishing, I mean, fly fishing is its own category for me because when you have a guy in a fight with a marlin, I'm sorry, <laughs> that's pretty incredible too. You know, backing down on a marlin with waves crashing and a marlin jumping and, you know, a guy on stand-up tackle just really just cranking the reel as hard as he can. I mean, that's pretty incredible to photograph and to be a part of as well. So I, I kind of just compartmentalize everything into different categories and I have a love for each one a little bit differently. So... <laughs> What about then if it comes to fish? What do you think, which is the one that you like to photograph the most uh, that you have a soft spot for that you really think, you know, ticks the boxes and you enjoy photographing? I would say that's trout. I mean, I can spend a little bit more time with trout as long as you, you know, keep them in the water and properly handle them and have them in a proper net and 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 really only uh, handle them for a very short period of time. But your accessibility to photographing trout, whether you throw a macro lens on or you stand far back and get them just to lift the, the fish barely up out of the water and get the droplets coming down and quickly put it back in the water. So I, I find that um, I can get a lot more angles and shoot a lot more images of one fish really quickly compared to say a marlin you get the marlin at the side of the boat and it's a crapshoot whether you'll get the shot so in terms of difficulty i'm very proud of my offshore uh, billfish shots because of how hard it really is to shoot bill offshore billfish kind of images you just have so many factors going against against you and whether or not a fish will cooperate at the side of the boat you can you can't take the fish out of the water and um I know some places in the world, they do drag sailfish and stuff out of the water, and I hate to see that, and I don't shoot those kind of images. I refuse to. Um, but, you know, tagging a marlin, they're holding the bill, and they're just getting it some water before they release it, and you're, you're, you dunk your underwater housing under, and you're shooting blindly back over at the fish. I mean, that's, that's a one in 10 shot that maybe you'll get the perfect shot on that. So um, I truly love to shoot fish. And, and, and the thing is, when I go out to shoot fly fishing here, if it's not for commercial work, I'll go out with friends, always bring my cameras, and I get to fish myself. And any fish I catch, I make someone else release it so I can get photos of it. Because I'm always trying to think of, okay, if I go out and fish for fun, I can actually make an income off of this later in the year. So it's kind of, uh, I think my friends sometimes uh, get maybe a little annoyed with that uh, aspect, but it, uh, it tends to work out really well. If, if you're not proactively thinking as a photographer in the industry, you have to remember that there's only so many magazines and only so many companies in this industry, and there's a lot of photographers. So you got to figure out a way to make yourself stand, stand out. And um, you're only going to get better the more you shoot and the more you practice too. So it's just something to keep in mind. That was really refreshing to hear coming back to 
the handling of the fish as well because you know somebody who has to earn their money from a shot you could easily keep the fish as long as you possibly could but it's really lovely to hear that you're thinking about getting the fish back as quickly as possible so i guess at times it may cost you a shot but the fish comes first is the sense i'm getting from you there Definitely. And I mean, there's, there's differences. So um, there's differences in different parts of the industry. So when I'm shooting trout, definitely. I mean, we have, we all know trout can't survive out of the water. I, I give, um, I gave a lecture back in um, January at the Denver fly show and my lecture on fishing photography really talked about how it's the photographer. If I'm the one deciding that, okay, I want to get pictures of this, then it's my responsibility that fish is health. If anything goes wrong, it's my fault at that point, because I'm the one getting the pictures of it. So I always try to give anglers tips. If you want to get good uh, photos of your fish and you, whether it's an iPhone to a nice camera, first step you need to do once you have the fish in the net and it's still in the water, get out of your boat, go to the side of the river, get out of your boat. And you're already have given that fish a better chance to survive. Because if you pick that fish up in the boat and you drop it, which happens all the time, uh, you've already caused that fish harm. So there's just like little tips and tricks you can do, um, especially when it comes to trout. Now, there's different parts of the industry that I work in where we have different fish that are have different kind of we call them more hardy fish. You know, they, they have a, they're more robust. So in the bass industry, in the bass industry, these bass, they throw nitro juice into the bass, um, wells with water to keep them, uh, you know, at like the water agitate or the bubbles agitate the water and it keeps the bath, bass healthy. And if you know anything, or I mean, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of the maybe uh, European uh, listeners out there might not know, but the bass fishing industry in America is the number one fishing industry and it's its own beast in itself. It's pretty incredible when you do go to these bass shows. I mean, it's fireworks and everything and anything. <laughs> As a Canadian, I truly appreciate it when I see it. But, you know, on some of these shoots, yeah, I mean, I, I would be lying to say that we don't really use those bass to our advantage. And then they go back in the tank and they get pumped with this nitro juice. And it's not always my most favorite thing. Um, but I try to be super conscious in a situation where, yeah, it's going to be my call in the end. If I feel like we're done with that fish, let's put that fish back. So in the trout world, you have a very short window. In the bass world, you have a longer window. Um, when it comes to marlin as, and billfish, it's pretty much up to the fish. It has nothing to do with me. And we're we're not holding those out of the water. Redfish are a much more robust fish. We also do tagging on redfish a lot down in Louisiana. So a lot of the time you have to have them off on the side of the boat. You put the tag in, they're in the net. You can usually hold them up for a picture or two. They're a very hardy, strong fish. So I, I, and, and you might get some listeners that might send me some fish info, which <laughs> I'm sure, you know, we're, we can all learn more about uh, a fish out there. But so I think it depends per species and also just like the situation you're in and the time of year. If it's, uh, for trout example, if it's winter time, you really don't want to be lifting those fish out of the water for a very long period of time because if the the air is colder above than below, it can actually be quite harmful on their lungs. So it's just stuff like that that if you educate yourself and listen to your people around you. So I've learned all the information from guides, guides and friends who know more about fishing than I do because I am I don't know it like everything about fly fishing. I've only been fly fishing for five years now since I moved to Montana. So I'm very new to the sport. So, you know, if I have that control of, of being the person to ask for the image, then I need to educate myself on what might be best for the fish. So. That's great. Um, and it's interesting because I wanted to lead this conversation this way into some tips as well. But as you know, with our magazine, we don't have grip and grins. It's my personal view and we have a magazine and that's the, that's the view that we don't have the fish lifted right out of the water. I'd much prefer, I don't think we need to do that these days. Um, and what we try and do is encourage people to fish uh, sorry, photograph the fish in an interesting and different sort of way. Have you got some advice for people who, you know, may not be shooting cameras, but get their phone out? A any advice of taking a good picture um, that they can put out in social media or just having their folder for themselves to look back on over winter? Yeah. So a, a couple tips that, uh, uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. So the first one I touched on earlier is when you've caught your fish and you have it in your net and you're at, it's at the side of the boat, 
ask your guide or ask your friend or whoever's rowing, if you are in a boat, just to pull over to the side so you can step out of the water. You and the cameraman step out uh, into the water. And um, I always have like the, the most important thing is I think you need to get low. You need to get low to the water line. Now, it might be harder for some of the older listeners here that might have a harder time maybe bending in the fish waders and stuff like that in your in your um, in the river. Um, so do the best you can. I think that if you can kneel down, I mean, you're in waders most of the time. Uh, if you can kneel down in the water, keep that net below the surface of the water and get yourself low. You've already done yourself justice and already you're going to get a better picture than just holding the fish up. So the next thing is if you are the, um, cameraman, and so you're coming at this from the cameraman's point of view, if you're shooting with an iPhone, there's a couple of things I suggest. You want to go into your preference settings and make sure you're already shooting on the highest resolution file you can on your iPhone. And a lot of people don't realize that your iPhone is usually not set to the highest, um, opt it's like set to optimize rather than um, uh, optimize basically means that it will be a, lar a smaller file because it's trying to um, uh, make more room for you to take more photos. So if you're going to go out fishing, go into your settings and, and check to make sure your iPhone is set to the highest resolution file possible. And I think that is really important because right away, again, automatically your, fo your photo will be improved because you've already set your camera to the best setting it can be on. Same for video. So go into your settings and make sure you're set to the highest resolution possible. If you're shooting with a GoPro, one thing, oops, sorry, knock the computer. One thing I always suggest is, um, set, you know, same thing, go into your GoPro, make sure you're on the highest settings. And then there's a little button on your GoPro that you can set so it can automatically come on when you press one button. So there's no fiddling around. That's the main thing. Get yourself to the point where you're comfortable with your cameras, where you've learned how to use them, where there's no fiddling about, because that is the worst thing for the fish. So then when you jump out of the boat with your camera, regardless of what camera it is, because the best camera you have, you know, uh, coined by many other photographers out there in the world, is the one that you have in your hand. That's the best camera you're going to have. So make sure you've just taken the time to learn how to get into those camera settings, and then you're not worried on your end. So in terms of um, improving your photos, so you've gotten you've got your angler to get low in the water. The net is still in the water. The fish is in the water. Um, if you're shooting above the water, so you don't have any kind of underwater protection for your camera, I always suggest that the main thing that I do is I want to be the person to tell my angler what they need to do. So I will look at them and I say, okay, fish up, fish down. Okay, fish up towards me fish down. And so make it very clear. So you're, you're blasting off a whole bunch of images as that fish is lifted up, maybe about half a foot, maybe not even that much water droplets coming off of it. And then I command them right away. I say, okay, fish down. And we kind of, that's how we work through the shoot. And then I said, okay, I'm going to get close. So the fish is still in the water. I'm going to get close to you. I want to get a shot of just the fish tail. So lift up for a second okay, down. And so that is how I work through photographing trout to keep them safe. And, um, you know, the best thing you can do for a trout is to not even take it out of the water, to be honest with you. Uh, but for magazines and such, I am required to shoot, you know, images where I can get details and, and stuff. So, you know, you also have to, um, decide whether that's a really robust fish that you're working with, or if you're, it was a long fight, a difficult fight, it might not be the best fish for you to, uh, to do that with. So th those are kind of some suggestions right now that I can think of at the top of my head is just be prepared, be prepared on your end, and then just know what kind of shots you want. So how you could go about doing that so easily is go on Instagram, type in trout into the tags. And then I always think like, take a whole bunch of screenshots of photographers' images that you like. Just keep them in a file on your phone and be like, okay, today I'm going to try to take an image like that. And then you know, when you've caught that fish, you're like, I know what I need to do. I know what position that fish needs to be in. And again, you know, maybe the, it only takes 30 seconds in total, a couple lift outs and a couple drops back in the water before that fish is back on its way. And that's the best thing you can do for the fish. Fantastic. And I'm just going to add something to that as well, is that in the back of each magazine, we have the keep and wet principles as well. And I think the best one that you can do is if you do need, and I don't always recommend it, but if you want to lift the fish a little bit, hold your breath while you're doing that. 
so that you're thinking about that as well because that fish has done the equivalent of running around the block a number of times and um i think if you hold your breath as well and, and it, it makes you more conscious of that as well so it might be something to to think about as well so um but they're really interesting tips and thank you for those i am sure there are some camera geeks listening what are you shooting with Well, so, uh, gosh, I am kind of a, I've got gear acquisition syndrome big time, (laughs) but my main, (laughs) my main kits that I use. So my commercial cameras, I'm, I shoot Nikon primarily, and I have transitioned from the DSLR Nikon world into the mirrorless world. And actually the mirrorless camera systems, if you are looking at getting a, a, a camera, you know, a consumer grade camera or a professional camera. I do recommend kind of transitioning more into mirrorless. And the reason for that is you can get shots at different, uh, you know, really close to the water. You can get shots from different angles using just the viewfinder of the screen. And it makes it a lot easier easier to to photograph images that you're kind of hoping for. So like you said, I absolutely do agree. If you don't need to lift that fish out of the water and you can keep the fish in the water and photograph it and you have an underwater camera, then I think that is definitely the best route to go. I bring an underwater camera on my shoots and I have a GoPro as well for video release footage. And so that is definitely the best thing you can do. But another thing too, if you if you buy a mirrorless camera or with your iPhone, if you get that phone, I, I stick my pinky out. So I'm holding my camera in my hand. I stick my pinky out on one of my fingers. And if my pinky touches the water, that's my stopping point. Don't get the camera any closer to the water. So then that way I can look at my screen and I can shoot really low right at that water line, right over to that fish. So you're now not even having to lift that fish out of the water very high. Maybe actually half of the fish is out of the water and the other half is still in the water. And you can shoot right at that line, that plane of, of, of the water line. You can get some beautiful images that way because now you've got gorgeous uh, reflections and everything like that. So I'm shooting with the Nikon mirrorless system and uh, Nikon Z7, and I've got two Nikon Z6s. And then I am shooting with a Sony a7R 3 as well with a macro 90 millimeter lens on it, which comes with me on all the trout stuff because that's the lens I can quickly you know, grab out to get the pictures of spots and eyeballs and fins. And, you know, that detail stuff that's really great for editorial articles that could be basically used anywhere in the article where they could throw type over. So that's like kind of the way I think when I'm shooting. And then lenses and such on the boat. So like a kit that I would take when I go fishing on the river would be a 24 to 70 f 2.8. I have a 14 to 30 F4 and a 90 millimeter lens. And then I might have the underwater housing with me as well, which we can do nice split shots. So, you know, fish below the water and angler above just to release the fish. So, you know, I do take a lot, but you do not need all this gear to create good, good images. That's one thing to keep in mind. Um, you know, I've just invested in my gear because it's my business and it's my company. Um, and then the last piece of equipment that I use that I find so beneficial, it's a system called Cotton Carrier. It's basically a chest harness. Uh, people on my Instagram know I talk about it all the time. I am an ambassador for them, so that's something to always keep in mind. But I basically can put a camera on my chest and a camera on my hip, and they lock on, and I can fly fish at the same time. So that's like the best point. I have two cameras already on me. I'm fly fishing. We hook into a fish guide nets it rod goes down i jump out of the boat i already have my cameras on me and ready so i did go to christmas island last year with a group of seven women and i wore this system i carried a boat i I had a little inflatable boat i named bertha uh she carried my waterproof backpack water bottle and underwater dive housing and that's strapped to my um you know, my strap on my waist that had my, my fish bag on it. And then I wore this cotton carrier harness system and it just allowed me to document everything and not have to fiddle with cameras and pull things out of bags. Because as we know, in saltwater environments on the ocean, it gets pretty sketchy pretty quick. So you got to be very careful. And so, yeah, it's just like little products that I find can help make things more fluid. I never want to be hindered by the gear I have. I just want it to add to, uh, to allow me to be able to be more fluid in my shoot. So I I'm like, it sounds silly, but I'm one with my gear. Like it helps me. I just, I know what I need to do and I'm not being hindered by settings and fiddling around. So that's the the current gear I'm using. And then the underwater dive housing is called Outtex. It's a, a modular system that's very affordable and 
com- is super compact, which is the best part because when I travel to uh, places all around the world, it's great. I can throw it in my pack. I don't need a dedicated Pelican case for it. And so it's just it's just little things like that. But again, you do not need all this gear to start making good images. Just keep that in mind. <laughs> Fantastic. Great, great tips. And thank you again for those. Um, let's go. We've got you. You're in Montana. Um, you know, the listeners, it may be a place they've been to. It may be a place they dream of. Obviously, you know, the river runs through it was, I think it was the Blackfoot it was based on, wasn't it? I know it was filmed on the Gallatin, I believe, um, which is Bozeman Way. But I just wondered what is it about the fishing there and 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 what do you love about it since you've you've been fly fishing what is it that that you think makes montana the dream destination for so many fly anglers well, i think one of the main things in montana that we are so incredibly lucky to have is fish access you know you talk to people from colorado or other places in the united states and how their restrictions go with the water usage and what they're allowed to fish it's pretty restrictive in a lot of places in the United States and who owns the water rights and what you can float through or what you can walk on high watermark or not. Like it can get very convoluted in some of these different places, especially like Colorado too. Like it's, it's very different there. So I am so thankful every day that if you want to enter a navigable water system from a public domain and you want to walk and wait it, you're allowed to, you're allowed to walk and wait it. you know, as long as you stay below that high water mark, you can get in and you can fish. So our access to these rivers are already tremendous. And we have a lot of places too in Montana where ranchers have allowed uh, foot traffic to kind of go through parts of their ranch to access parts of the river um, down in Craig. Uh, you know, that's one area down there where there's a couple areas that you can access the river. Um, and we have a lot of different water so I know we get a lot of tourists coming here to fish and, and that's, that's great. And that's incredible for our guides and, um, tourism is, you know, our, I believe our number one industry here in Montana. Um, but the best thing is if you don't own a float boat or maybe you don't have the funds to go and float the river, there's so many great streams and creeks and different areas that you can access on foot that you can go fish. So like I said, at the end of my property, I have a tiny little creek that goes through the corner of the property. And if in June, when the water level is higher, um, you can legally fish these small little creeks um, that come in from the mountains, basically. And you can catch on a little 2.8 fiberglass rod. You can catch, you know, a little brown trout and little brook trout. And so there's tons of these little creeks everywhere. So you don't always have to go fish the major river, fi- you know, systems. I myself love to fish everything and anything. I just like to fish. So I know one of the questions you had asked me if I'm dry fly or if I'm, uh, you know, anything else, I, I don't care. Whatever I need to do to catch a fish that day, whether I'm throwing on, I like to call them bobbers. I refuse to call them indicators because I think that's too elitist. <laughs> They're, it's basically a bobber. Um, you know, so if I have to throw a worm on there or a, uh, you know, a Pat's rubber legs or, an, you know, olive or anything like that, like I'll do it. I don't care because it's fun and it's fishing. And to be honest with you, because of my job, I spend most of my time watching everybody fish. I don't actually get to fish very often myself. So that is something to keep in mind that when I do get the chance in my own time to go fishing or pick up a rod, I just want to fish. It doesn't matter what it is uh, and how I'm doing it. And of course, getting an eat, a big top water eat on a dry fly is wonderful and amazing. But I think it just makes you more grateful for those moments that you do have that opportunity. Um, and so I'm not the person who's like, meh, I'm a refuse to go out there. There's nothing hatching. No, I don't care. I'll go out there and I'll maybe not won't catch anything, but you know, I'll dredge for something. And it's just a lot of fun. And so I think that's what separates Montana from a lot of places is our public access to these waterways and how many different rivers we have and how many different creeks and streams and, you know, different places that you can you can get to and you can camp and you can walk to and you can fish. And that is so special about this place. Um and, you know, where I live, so I know a lot of people like to go to Bozeman or they say, oh, I've been to Montana. I've been to Bozeman. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I bet you have. <laughs> um, you know, a lot of people, I think, overlook Missoula at times. I think Missoula is a, a wonderful city. And I think the best part about living here um, or even if you head down to like Craig, 
you can fish all winter long. You can, you can, you can, uh, let's say I went down and spay cast it on down in Craig, um, this past, uh, winter and I, it was wonderful and it was fun and it was cold. So as long as you're okay with the cold and put on a lot of layers. So I fish generally is the, the winter time is my time to fish in Montana because the summer, spring, and fall, that's when I'm shooting and that's when I'm on location in other parts of the, the country or the world. So for me, winter fishing has become super special because it's quiet. There's not a lot of people out on the river and um, you can catch some beautiful, gorgeous trip fish at that time of year, big fish too, at, at you know, in the winter time. So I think like Missoula gets a little bit overlooked, but we, we stay pretty mild all year round. And it's a really great place to come and fish, whether you want to fish in the winter, spring, summer, or fall. And the fall in Montana is stunning. So I do recommend coming here in the fall for sure. <laughs> I've usually aimed for September, I must admit, because it's a little quieter as well. Um, it does get cold as well. Or it, I'm often the season here because I was guiding for 16 years. Actually, I say September. I have been out in September. But it would be the season finishes here 30th of September and I'd be at the airport at Heathrow on the 1st of October flying out to to fish the streams there and I echo what you say and I know I said a little bit about it at the very beginning that if you are thinking about a trip I would definitely as well I don't have the experience Jess does but uh, Missoula I just think has it and you don't need to go far for those rivers you know like we said the Bitterroot, Blackfoot, Clark Fork, Rock Creek. I'm sure there's loads that I never discovered, but there's loads there, isn't there? And and yeah. famous places to go fish. Definitely. And that's the best part is that, you know, not everybody is going to be stacked up on the same river. I know some rivers get pretty busy, but because of that, you have an opportunity to fish a massive variety of rivers there. And uh, Blue Ribbon, you know, the streams is, you know, basically classified, I think, Rock Creek and, you know, uh, maybe the Big Hole, I'm not sure. But you have all these opportunities to fish all these different rivers and you have a whole bunch of outfitters in Missoula as well. And um, they're all set up for you just to arrive. And there's some that can even provide um, places for for like Airbnb style rentals and stuff like that. And then if you come down the Bitterroot, there's a lot of great guides down here um, as, as well. So there's never a short of guides in Montana or and even if you say wanted to do a wade fishing trip, there's guides who will do that with you too. And then if you wanted to do something on your own and you've, you, you know, you're a very experienced angler or, and maybe you know this area, maybe you've come here, opportunities for you to kind of strike out on your own as well. Um, you know, for myself personally, I get a little bit nervous of some of the grizzly bear stuff and the, and the moose and also high water and stuff. So I always try to fish with a partner, but, um, you know, it's just always something to keep in mind. You've got to carry your bear spray here. Um, but yeah, I just, I think we're just so lucky to have the rivers at our um, access that we do. And we have really great people and leadership trying to protect these rivers and streams here, especially in Montana. And I think that's really amazing with Trout Unlimited, you know, everything that they're doing to to help rebuild areas, or parts of streams and such. So, um, you know, I, I'm a part of a local fly club the down here in the Bitterroot. And we... Uh, you know, we have a great time discussing, um, you know, different projects that are going on. And people are very vocal in Montana about, too, about projects that might be started to, that could harm a river system. So I think it's a great state. Also, we have no sales tax. So <laughs> if you want to come to Montana, you're not going to have to pay tax on any items while you're here. So that's always great. Um and uh, yeah, it's a pretty cool state. I, I'm I'm so grateful that I moved from BC here um, because I think I think I hit the jackpot in terms of how amazing it is here. Yeah, yeah, it is a fabulous, fabulous place, and it's it's getting me. It's been a few years since I've been um, there, and it's getting me thinking about it. Funny you should mention bears. We saw a grizz driving from Missoula it was a young one on the road from Missoula to Wisdom and then we fished is it the bitter route that runs through Hamilton yep yeah and we went into the fly shop and I actually go self-guided you know we just make it up and my friend that I often go with his friend lives in Missoula and has a drift boat so we drifted the bitter route a couple of days but we just wet we weighed you know the rest of the time and we went into the fly shop in Hamilton and um asked the guy said we don't know where to go where should we go and he said well the town water and we thought yeah he's put us in soon <laughs> and the fishing was brilliant 
it was fantastic. You know, we thought we'd to keep it keep us out of the way, sort of stuff. But we did see a black bear cross the river right by us. And my buddy said, the one thing we do is walk slowly away. He said, do not run. And it was no distance. Yeah. And that thing waded through the bitter root there. It was the other side, like it was, you know, a tiny little trickle of water. It was unbelievable to see. And it was fine. You know, it was fine. But that's about my closest encounter. I had one actually. I was fishing in Oregon in October on the North Umqua and I saw one which was walking away pretty close as I was going down a fisher pool. And it was that sense of being watched. It wasn't watching me or slightest bit interested in me. But I think as long as, like you say, if you're aware and you're careful and if you're unsure, I always shout, hey, bear, or whatever it is. And then it's generally fine, isn't it? As long as you're sensible and aware, isn't it? It's fine. Yeah. I mean, here in Montana, unfortunately, we do have, um, you know, bear incidences, uh, grizzly bear specific incidences in certain parts of Montana, but primarily those are due to um, hunting, hunting situations where someone's cleaning uh, their kill or, you know, whatever. And uh, uh, there have, you know, generally, I hate to say this, but on average, there's like three to four bear attacks a year in Montana where people actually die, but it's primarily hunting related. Um And they're down in kind of closer to Yellowstone areas, but um, you just need to be careful. You need to be cautious. You need to make sure that when you're out in the wild, you're out in their territory. Uh, Most of the time, they don't really want to have anything to do with anything you're doing, uh, especially, you know, they're fearful. Um, You know, but anywhere you go, you have to be careful, whether it's your fishing in British Columbia, where, you know, where I'm from, um, you really have to be careful and let bears know you're there. We get a lot of garbage bears there who are, you know, learn to eat garbage from residential areas. And those bears you have to be very careful of. And in Alaska, they have tons of grizzly bears, but those bears are usually interested in just the salmon. So, you know, you just have to be careful and be aware. And that's why I say, you know, I always carry bear spray on me. Um, I try to fish in groups. And when you're walking through thick brush or anything like that make sure you're making a lot of noise make whatever animal there um you you know you know is aware that you're there um and so again like i've never had an issue with it and um i'm more worried about the moose in in parts of the big hole when i'm walking (laughs) than i am about the grizzly bears there but yeah you just need to be careful anywhere you go uh but i think also that's what makes montana super amazing and when you think about cowboys in the wild well come to montana because it's still true here (laughs) It is awesome, isn't it? And yes, it's got me thinking again, I have to say. Um, I guess I know the answer to this, but what is your favorite stream in Montana? Uh, It would have to be the big hole. And I think it's just because of it's stunning up there. It's beautiful. And um, I mean, the fact that you can catch grayling is pretty incredible. And it can be difficult at times, but I just think it's one of the coolest areas too. You know, the big hole also has the, gosh, it's like the highest amount of cattle anywhere in the United States is in this one area. They still are full cowboy up there. They, you know, they brand on horseback. They, they uh, still move cows on horseback. I've been a part of a whole bunch of different cattle drives where we're riding on horseback. And as a city girl, it's like everything I, I, I thought of thought Montana was and more. Um, I'm a little dude ranchy though. I just hang at the back, (laughs) but you know, so it's just all these adventures you can do up in that area. And the big hole river is just beautiful. And, um, and quiet too. There's a lot of great streams that flow into it that you can fish, um, as well. And so I like it, you know, I love the Bitterroot and I would say the Bitterroot is the river I float the most when I get an opportunity to fish, but the Bitterroot can be hit hard, especially in the summertime. So as you said, the fall shoulder seasons, uh, it's not only going to be absolutely gorgeous here. I mean, we might get snow at the end of September, but it's going to be gorgeous regardless. Uh, it's so dry in general here that, um, you know, you can't go wrong on a stream like like the uh, the, the Bitterroot. The Blackfoot's stunning. The Clark Fork's so much more wide open. So I find it's a totally different fishery in itself. And uh, I hate to admit this, but I have not fished Rock Creek yet. And I have, oh, I know, I just haven't had a chance, but I have a friend who's going to take me to like her areas. So um, I've been kind of saving it. You know, it's, it's about time I, I get over there and fish that a bit. But I don't really think you can go wrong regardless where you're fishing in Montana. So, yeah, yeah, I think it's fair to say it's all good, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty great. <laughs> and as I know, we have a love of Labradors as well. And I know I think you've got, is it two or three? 
I have two female labs and we call them the girls. And uh, uh, one of them actually was on the cover of Drake magazine last year. So trying to make them famous. I know that really- picture. Oh, I've yeah. got that copy. Now I know it. Yeah. Yep. That's my hand. I'm standing there with her uh, looking down. They are uh, not great fishing dogs. <laughs> so they love the water so much. If we're in a float boat, they'll stay in the float boat. But if I jump out to like fish any section on foot, no, they'll be right next to me and swimming. And um, so they are difficult to fish with, but they, uh, I have the sweetest labs imaginable. My husband and I, you know, we, we love them, but unfortunately they do need to stay home if we really plan to fish seriously. But we do actually a lot of lake fishing here in Montana as well. That's one thing to add in that regardless if you want to fish on a fly rod or if you want to fish conventional, we have a ton of lakes you can fish here in Montana. And uh, we have a boat that we take out. And um, depending on where we're fishing, I usually bring a, I've got a six weight, it's called a shore stalker G Loomis rod. So it's kind of shorter, but it's meant for chucking kind of heavier things. Like say if you were going to fish for bass or or, you know, kind of a hardier fish. I rig that up with like a sink tip and I'll stand at the front of the boat and I'll be casting out with the fly rod and and my husband will have his conventional tackle at the back, whatever he's doing. And I find that to be a lot of fun because there's a couple rivers in Montana that you can act or rivers, sorry, lakes in Montana that you can actually cast, uh, catch bass in, which, um, there's, there's only like two or three, but it's a lot of fun. And of course you can catch a pike. Um, you can catch massive lake trout. I'm talking about huge lake trout and, uh, their lake trout can be a problem in, in a lot of lakes. So they're a ton of fun to catch. So, you know, whether you're conventional or if you're fly, that's always a great thing too, that you could come to Montana on your trip and you could go fly fishing and then you could go uh, rent a guide on Flathead or, or you know, one of those those lakes and get out there and you can conventional fish for perch or anything like that. So I mean, we just have such a diverse fishery. Um and it depends on you if you want to fish it all year round. If you're into ice fishing, come on out. We've got great ice fishing in the winter too. <laughs> so, but I think all bases are covered. It was interesting you were saying about the dogs. You obviously preempted where I was going with that and whether they were fishing dogs or not. And Labradors and water. And we've, as I've said on many of these before, we've trained our dog and he'll walk down a pool with us or he'll wade next to me. Um, so it's kind of nice. And I'm just looking to see if there's anyone else who's got a similar sort of story as well, but clearly not the case this time. I would love for them to be a little bit more. I mean, I call them pretty, <laughs> not always smart. I call my dogs. I'm like, they're just super pretty. <laughs> um, so they're so sweet, but together, um, even if uh, they do, my husband does a little bird hunting, but together they are very well trained, but together they get so excited and that's the problem. They feed off of that. And so they just can't help themselves. So, um, they do come though on the lakes and they'll come in the boat on the lakes and they'll go fishing with us. And they're actually great on our boat on the lake. They sit on the back of the swim platform at the back and they just stare at the water and they stare at the fish we're bringing in. Um, so they're great uh, at that. And if I bring them solo on the river, they're much better better um in terms of they just will they're not as adventurous when they're not together i should say so if i am walking and waiting no i i cannot bring them with me because they will get in the pool and they'll disturb everything and then they'll look back at me like what what did i do wrong (laughs) so uh they are sweet though and they're young they're five four and five so uh they're they're goofballs and i'm just grateful i have them so Fantastic. This is a really interesting question because you live where most people would dream to fish. Where is your dream fly fishing destination? Where would you love to go, be it in the US or be it further afield? Where is is there somewhere that you're thinking I would like to go cast a fly there? So like again, like I'm super grateful to be a to have been able to say photograph fishing all over the world, like going to Christmas Island and photographing that. Um, I fished one day there, but I was shooting a, a short film and shooting images for a magazine. So, you know, I wasn't really able to really dive into that fishery there, but I would love to go to Patagonia. I'm hoping it's going to happen here at some point sooner than later. Um, I, I think I could definitely 
part that out to quite a few different magazines. Uh, but it would probably be something where I would go with a group and I would shoot for the group. Not so much a commercial work um, in that regard, but shoot for the group and then probably have editorial pieces to sell to magazines. And that's what would get me to Patagonia kind of thing. But yeah, I, I want to go to Patagonia so bad. Um, you know, I, I think the U.S. fishery too for fly fishing all over the different parts of the U.S. We don't always need to go places that are take us outside of the United States. There's great fisheries within the U.S. Um, whether you want to fish for stripers, uh, maybe go all the way up to Maine and fish for their brook trout there, um, or down to you know Louisiana and f- fish redfish, and um, maybe go off- offshore and fish for tuna, or maybe try your hand at marlin or, or anything like that. Like there are opportunities within the United States to fish these great fisheries. So you don't always need to leave home. That's the best part. Now, when you're in Europe, I imagine there's probably great fisheries kind of all around that you can access that it's a little bit easier for you to travel to than it would be for us to then go across the pond to the other side. But, you know, I would also love to fish in Norway. My father's from Norway and I've been to Norway four times in my life and I just haven't, um, I wasn't into fly fishing when I was there, you know, throughout my life. So love to go to Norway and, and fly fish. I have conventionally fished in Norway many times, but you know, so it's just a couple locations where I think like the scenery and stuff, because also I'd be coming at it from a photography point of view where I'm like, I could fish, but I could also get some epic images. <laughs> so it's kind of a uh, kind of two, two birds with one stone kind of deal if I get to go somewhere. So, but I've been very grateful for the areas I've been. And, um, you know, that, that Christmas Island trip was the first true far, far trip that I've ever taken specifically to photograph just fishing. So it was pretty, pretty different that, that, that place. And the fishing was, was super interesting and, uh, we had terrible weather. (laughs) So if people ask me if I enjoyed it and I'm like, well, we had horrible weather, but yeah, it was different. (laughs) So yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, it's been, we've spoken or been talking for well over an hour now and it's been a really really fascinating podcast to get some an insight into working in the industry but in a different sphere of the industry as well and I I think it's been fabulous to to learn about that we've learned about photography we've learned how to take better pictures you're in a you should be a ambassador for montana as well it's it's fantastic what you you said and i i can only echo it in the times i've been a number of times and i just do think it's fantastic fishing and and if you can get out there like you say there's lodges there's other bits and pieces but you can do it on your own as well and it's easy because of the access it's easy to buy a state license find a bit of river and go fish it and that's the really cool thing about it. As you say, the access, and I fished in Colorado a little bit, and I know the last time I was out there, they were starting to get a little bit um, scratchy about some of the areas and, and access and stuff like that. And I sincerely hope it doesn't happen over there as well. So, But, Jess, it's been brilliant. I'd like to thank you again as well. I love watching your Instagram feed as well. Where can, where can people find you on Instagram, Facebook? Um, have you got a website so they can see the images that you take? Because they are, like you say, you know, there is a difference between a snapper like myself and who just takes pictures with a camera and a, a real professional. Where can people get a sense of, of your work? Where can they find that? Yeah. So, uh, my Instagram feed, so my, my photography business is still under my maiden name. So my Instagram feed is Haydal photo, uh, the Norwegian spelling of Haydal. So it's H A Y D A H L and Haydal photo kind of like roar, uh, 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 rare, what's his name? Um, the author, something hair, hair doll or whatever. But, um, so yeah, so you can reach me on Instagram is probably the thing that I update the most. Um, and if you have any questions about fishing photography or anything like that, you can just, uh, send me a message. I, I try to answer as many questions as possible just to help people, you know, even when they're trying to think of what camera they want to buy in the, in the market, so saturated with cameras that, you know, I try my best to help kind of direct people in that direction. Um, on Facebook, I have, uh, Jessica Hadel photography. And then I have a website. If you just put in Jessica Hadel, I'm 
actually the only one in the world. So you will find me, um, whether it's my hockey statistics from college, so don't judge me, but um, also my website or just images I've taken. So you'll be able to find me um, in magazines now, though. I go by Jessica Hadel Richardson. So my married name is Richardson. Um, but there's a bajillion Jessica Richardsons in the world because it's like 25 most common names in America. So um, yeah, Jessica Hadel is is the main is the main way to to find out information. And again, like if you send me a message, I'll, I'll try my best to kind of point people hopefully in the right direction. Um, and yeah, it's it's just you know I I always try to like promote anybody to get out there and create content. Cause I think the more of us making content, the better it will inspire more people. It inspires myself. Sometimes I see images and I'm like, wow, like I want to do something similar to that. So I think like that is the most important thing. Don't ever let gear stop you from creating content. So no, no matter if you just have an iPhone, you can get very creative with an iPhone. You just have to learn your settings on it. So that's something I always kind of you know, throw out there. And, um, I also, you know, as one of the only females in this industry, there's two of us basically. Um, and I'm the only one in the conventional saltwater side that works full time commercial side of it. Um, you know, I always try to also promote more females in the industry to try to get out there and, and create as much content as they can. Um, I created the outdoor or the female outdoor creative collective on Instagram. So please go in and join us there, whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, we're, we're just starting off. And my, my hope is just to, through education and learning and working together, we can try to hopefully get some more females out there in this industry to create the content, especially when we photograph other, um, you know, females. I feel like sometimes we can portray the way we see ourselves a little bit better. The saltwater side can be particularly bad for how we photograph um, or view females. Unfortunately, they uh, definitely objectify on the saltwater side. Um, and so, you know, I'm just trying to not only represent myself as a, you know, uh, a photographer that works hard, but also trying to represent and hopefully bring a whole bunch of females with me so we can kind of create some great content and um, show that this this industry with the fastest growing market is females in fly fishing, especially um, to just try to like bring everybody together and, and, and photograph in that way. And so I have actually, I have some workshops, but due to everything going in the world where I'm just not sure how, if I have to cancel or, or not, but, um, after I launched it, it's for females only to learn how to shoot fishing photographer photography. I had a ton, ton of guys saying, don't leave us out. And I, I was like, I'm not going to leave you out. Don't worry. We will make some workshops here in Montana um, that we can go out on the river and do some fishing workshops. So, you know, if you head to my um, Instagram at some point, hopefully I can launch those here in the next little bit. We just have to kind of wait to see where the world goes right now. And that's okay. So, Hey, if you're at home and you have time, this is a great time to go create the content. This is a great time to practice. This is a great time to do a lot of walks around your driveway with your iPhone or your camera and, and just practice. Start practicing your photography. And, and then when it comes time to getting back out on that river, you'll be ready. Fantastic, Jess. Thank you. That's a really lovely way to end things. And um, I'd like to thank you again for um, you know providing such a great, um, front cover for us i'm super pleased with it super proud of it and hopefully when it eventually gets out to you it'll join that um wall of fame up there behind you as well it will i'll send you a picture once it gets here the frame is ready for it and it's gonna get i know the spot it's going so i'll send you a, a picture of the studio once it's up fantastic jess thank you so much um it's been a really fascinating and enjoyable podcast to record as well and to talk about a place um that means so much to me and and learn a lot of stuff along the way so thank you so much jess thanks for having me appreciate it everyone this has been the fly culture podcast thank you so much for listening if there are guests you think i should be speaking to if there are topics if there are subjects just drop me a line that's not a problem at all i always try and respond really quickly to people um we are in lockdown while we're recording this. I hope to put this out in the next two to three weeks. Um, if I don't, I, I'm sure I probably will. But um, when you listen to this, I hope you're all safe. I hope you're feeling good. And um, thank you so much for listening to uh, the Fly Culture Podcast. Thank you very much indeed. The Fly Culture Podcast is brought to you in association with Fly Culture, a quarterly print magazine. For more information, please visit flyculturemag.com. 
You can also find Fly Culture on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.